Hi, it's Steve Hargadon, and welcome to the second keynote of our inaugural Global STEMX Education Conference. This has really been a blast. So delighted to have Sherry and Amy here. The conference does have some great great sponsors and supporters. They don't get much in return except knowing from the good the depths of their hearts that they have supported something valuable. This slide here is about the only recognition they get. We appreciate that they're willing to, to support the event with um, so little recognition, but we do really appreciate them. And please let them know, if you know anybody at these organizations, how much it has meant to be able to do this for free for you. So this is a chance for you to indicate where you're participating from in the audience. Look to the left of the map. You're looking for a star or a sun icon. It's the second one down. You double click on that and then click on the map. You can shout out in the chat the exact location, the time, the temperature. Oh, nice to have a geographically diverse crowd. Feel free to keep that information flowing in the chat. And I'm going to turn the time over now to Sherry and Amy. Thank you both for being here. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Steve, for all the work that you've put into making this conference happen. It's really exciting to see how, how far ranging all of the visitors are to this session. So thank you all for being here. This is Amy Cameron in, um, speaking now. And I'm here with my colleague, Sherry Metcalf. Hello. Sherry, you want to say hi? Hi, everybody. And um, the work that we're going to talk about today is uh, a collaboration between myself and Sherry, along with um, Chris Deedy and Tina Grosser, who are professors at the Graduate School of Education at Harvard University um, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And Sherry works with Chris and Tina at the Graduate School of Education at Harvard. And I, I did previously work with them and am currently working at the New York Hall of Science, which is a fantastic science museum in Queens, New York. So I'm currently in Queens, New York, and Sherry is currently in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, we anticipated a broad uh, audience for this presentation. So we'll be presenting on the EcoMobile project, but we'll also be talking about um, a prior project called EcoMove, which is currently freely available for download to teachers and practitioners who might like to use it in their classrooms and in their teaching. So um, by presenting both on a, a project that's sort of finished and ready to be released, and also the EcoMobile project, which is a current research project, we hoped that this would appeal to practitioners and researchers who are interested in these topics. So um, we pre prepared a presentation, but have also left plenty of time at the end for questions. So to get started, I wanted to place this in the frame of um, what's been happening recently in the United States with our development of the next generation science standards. The new and one of the new and innovative things about these standards are that they really put a focus on students being able to engage in and explore scientific practices in authentic ways and contexts. And so some of the things that are included in this idea about scientific practices are um, helping students to be able to analyze and integrate data, being able to engage in argumentation from evidence, and to understand the role of models in scientific thinking. So these are some of the, the, the ideas and concepts that we're focusing on, and we think that our work really um, has a lot of power. To, uh, to add to the curriculum. Also, the next generation science standards are focusing on cross-cutting concepts um, 
which uh, we also feel that um, EcoMove and EcoMobile are well positioned to address, such as understanding patterns, um, thinking about cause and effect, and thinking about stability and change in different systems. So these kinds of concepts are the ones that um, some of the work you'll see uh, we, we'll, we'll talk about focus on. And finally, the nature of science is an interesting area that the standards have also focused on. And this gets to the recognition that um, in different domains of science, there are epistemic frames that people bring to the way that they do science. And it's important to give students and um, opportunity to explore how science is done in different domains. And we think that our, our work is contributing to this, this effort, um, particularly in the domain of ecosystem science. So in the work of EcoMobile that we're talking about today, we, um, it builds upon uh, a project called EcoMove, which stands for Ecological Multi-User Virtual Environment. And this is a project that just um, completed its uh, research phase last year, and it is currently available for free download from our website, which is ecomove.gse.harvard.edu. Um, so you can Google it, and I'm sure you'll find it. Um, but the, the project really uh, looked at ecosystem science and learning, um, in the context of complex causality, and Sherry will talk a bit more about the project in just a minute. But this project um, has completed, but really informs and is built upon um, in the project that I'll talk about later as well called EcoMobile, which is where we're taking the work students do in EcoMove in the classroom and building upon it when they go out into real environments and explore the ecosystems in their own backyards. So um, what we're doing with EcoMove plus EcoMobile is we're really trying to blend um, immersive experiences in both the classroom and in the real world and understand what these immersive technologies can lend to learning about ecosystem science and particularly the practices um, that go into understanding ecosystems. As way of a comparison, I wanted to point out um, why we decided to use both EcoMove and EcoMobile um, in the work that we're doing today. Um, the two platforms uh, really bring different and complementary things to the table. So with EcoMove, um, which again stands for multi-user virtual environment, it's used um, on a desktop computer in the classroom and previous work has shown that it promotes self-efficacy in science, that with these virtual environments, you can simulate experiences that wouldn't otherwise be possible in school settings. That gives you a lot of bang for your buck. And um, in that way, we can explore time and scale in ways that we couldn't in the real world. The students take on roles and work in teams in a different way than you can facilitate normally in the classroom. And um, by sharing this immersive experience in a virtual environment, it can contextualize the concepts that they're learning about, and it can support and scaffold the inquiry um, process. With EcoMobile, um, as we take students outside and help them learn about ecosystems in the outdoors, what we find is that the, um, the value of that is that the students are getting experiences that are, have greater fidelity and sensory richness. They experience physical interactions with organisms and environments, which can be hugely motivating for the students. And um, they get to do self-directed collection of real-world data and artifacts. And all of this is facilitated by various forms of technology that we, we use on mobile devices, including cameras, recording devices, probes, GPS, mapping, graphing, and augmented reality. So we're really exploring how the complementary affordances of these forms of technology can support students learning in ecosystem science. Now I'll hand it over to Sherry to talk more about the specifics of EcoMove and um, how we've used it in the classroom. Thank you, Amy. Hi, I'm Sherry Metcalf. 
um, and I'm here uh, talking to you from Cambridge, Massachusetts. And uh, I'm going to talk about EcoMove. Uh, EcoMove includes two multi-user virtual environments. Um, one represents a forest, and the other represents a pond ecosystem. And today we're going to talk about the pond, but both um, modules are um, they're complementary, and some teachers use both of them, and we've had great success with each one in the classroom. They are each uh, a two-week curriculum unit uh, that are inquiry-based or problem-based, um, and the students explore the ecosystem and are self-directed in collecting data and trying to uh, understand the ecosystem by working in teams and collaboratively collecting data and coming up with hypotheses about the interrelationships in the system. So. For this, um, to get to get give you a better idea about the talk, um, about the software, I'm going to show a, a short video. Sorry, let me go back. I'm going to show a short video too. And um, if you have any trouble seeing the video, uh, let me know. But you can also access the video from our website at ecomove.gse.harvard.edu. So here's the video. EcoMove is an exciting new curriculum research project at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. They use immersive virtual environments to teach middle school students about ecosystems and causal patterns. It includes two computer-based modules, Pond and Forest, within a four-week inquiry-based ecosystems curriculum. Here we are in the Pond module. You can walk around the pond and see all the different plants and animals, like these ducks. The camera tool lets us take pictures, and saving the photo displays a virtual field guide with information about each of the organisms we find. We can also walk under the water to see the species living there. And using a virtual microsubmarine, we can shrink down and see the microscopic life in the pond at different levels of magnification. The environment around the pond includes features like a golf course, roads, and houses. Following this runoff pipe leads us to a drainage ditch near a new housing development, where we meet a landscaper putting down fertilizer. Throughout the environment, on different days, you meet virtual characters like Manny, who may provide useful information. Back at the pond, the water measurement tools let us take various measurements of the water in the pond, such as phosphates and turbidity. Students can collect weather and population data as well. The calendar tool lets us travel through time in order to see how the pond has changed on different days. Here, it's raining. When we walk under the water, we can see how cloudy the water is. The turbidity is higher, and we can also take another measurement. The data view lets us see and compare data we've collected. All right, so let me see if I can remember how to stop sharing the video. Here we go. So now we should be back to the slides. And um, there we go. So I wanted to uh, point out some of the features that make it, um, that scaffold students in exploring this virtual ecosystem, collecting data, and starting to fit the pieces together. So on the First day, students are exploring the world and they're using the camera tool to click on the plants and animals they find in the ecosystem. And clicking on an animal brings up its picture and then that takes you to a field guide that shows information about the organism, um, its species, what it eats, what eats it, and so on. And the field guide shows a list of all of the species that are in this simulated ecosystem as sort of a scavenger hunt for students to see how many uh, species they can find. 
And then on the second day, students uh, work to create a food web of all of the interrelationships between the organisms using the same images and the same species that they had discovered in the virtual world. Um, so, and, and we make a, a special point of emphasizing that the energy of the food web system comes from the sun and leads through microorganisms to macroscopic organisms and even to humans in the world. Some of the other features that you saw in the video were that the students uh, travel in time. In the pond, students travel over eight virtual days in a summer and uh, see what happens over time. The fertilizer that the landscaper was putting down at that housing development uh, gets washed into the pond during a rainstorm, and so students see a rise in uh, nitrates and phosphates from the fertilizer that causes um, a, a growth in the algae. Students can measure that population data as well. So you can see over time, they're getting this information not just by reading about it, but by experiencing it. When they walk under the water, and I saw somebody commenting that, oh, they walk under the water. They um, you can see that the pond gets murkier and gets a little greener over time because of the increased algae. And when they go into the microscopic submarine, they will see the, um, the microscopic algae uh, in the water collect population data, but also just get a sense that, wow, there's a lot of algae in the water. I wonder why, and I wonder what the effect of that is going to be. So as students are collecting data, they also have access to learning quests that give them background information just in time so that they can make sense of the data that they collect. And as they work with their team, each student works on a team of four, and each student on the team is responsible for different types of data, different expertise. So we use a jigsaw pedagogy where they each learn about parts of an ecosystem and then have to put all their knowledge together. And they can look at the data that they've collected in tables and graphs over time to see changes over time and figure out what's going on in the ecosystem. The reason that they are doing all of this is that as they um, travel in time, they discover that on one of the virtual days, all the large fish in the pond have died. And so the question is, what killed the fish in the pond? And so they work with their team to try to figure that out by looking at the data they collected forming and forming hypotheses backed up by the evidence from the virtual world to uh, come up with an explanation. And then the, uh, the unit culminates with each student team putting together a content map that represents their hypothesis about what killed the fish and presenting it to the class along with the evidence that they have about um, why they think that their hypothesis is correct. So now I'm going to hand it back to Amy, who talks, and we'll talk about how this work uh, fits with the new research we're doing for EcoMobile. Great. Right, thank you, Sherry. So going back to our theme um, that we brought up at the beginning of the session around um, helping students to engage in scientific practices, uh, the material that EcoMove covers is done in this inquiry-based um, curriculum. And we have scaffolded, carefully scaffolded the inquiry process so that the students um, can feel a sense of accomplishment as they go through this process and engage in some parts um, while other parts are sort of simplified for them. So the ways that we scaffold scaffolded the inquiry process for students in EcoMove are that the question that they have to answer, especially in the pond uh, curriculum, is predefined. They, they're able to explore and discover the fish kill, but once, once they do discover the fish kill, that sort of automatically becomes the, the primary question that they're trying to answer, is why those fish died. Um, obviously, the data collection that they do in the virtual world is quite simulated compared to what they would do in a real environment. Um, they can only collect a single value for each variable on a given date for the pond. And those data are quickly and easily um, loaded for them in a table and in a graph that they can toggle between. So this takes away some of the cognitive load associated with collecting data in a real environment and allows the students to really focus on the patterns that they're starting to see with the data and on collaborating with each other um, to 
to collect the data and make sense of it. Um, and finally, the, the explanations that are possible within the pond environment for what caused the fish to die are constrained by the, the types of data that they can collect and the likely inferences that they'll make based on the, the limited data that ways um, the EcoMove is not an authentic um, inquiry experience for the students, but it does give them a very nicely scaffolded um, experience to start out with students who may not be familiar with um, the processes of inquiry. But obviously, we would like students to move from the scaffolded experience to be able to do uh, inquiry practices in real world ecosystems. But some of the challenges associated with authentic inquiry are that it does require the student to put together content knowledge that they have with these processes and practices. And that can be very challenging if they don't have the right content knowledge to inform the questions that they want to ask, the kinds of data they think they need to collect, and the kinds of inferences they can make based on the data they collect. Um, also, with cognitive, um, the cognitive processes that are required for, for inquiry in a real environment are often hard to replicate in a classroom. And that leads to you know, presenting the students with maybe some, some labs that are, are very structured and, and canned so that they can um, engage in aspects of inquiry but, um, but not necessarily, um, don't always necessarily map on to real world um, situations. Finally, there's the challenge that novices come to the table with much different assumptions than experts would about both the content and about the um, process of inquiry and how to put together their pieces of evidence into um, something that makes sense. So these, are, these various challenges um, are something that we are trying to help students overcome as they start to work with us in EcoMobile in a real environment. So we're taking EcoMove and their scaffolded inquiry experience and now trying to help them continue to grow as scientists as they move out and do um, inquiry activities in real world ecosystems. So with the EcoMobile project, we're doing this in two, primarily two ways. Uh, we're integrating augmented reality and probeware as two different forms of technology to help students learn during middle school ecology field trips. So our research questions um, that are funded by a National Science Foundation grant for EcoMobile really focus on exploring these, these technologies, these mobile technologies, and seeing how they can support students when they are struggling to apply inquiry-based practices in real ecosystems. So I want to tell you a little bit more about what we mean by augmented reality. In this case, we're focusing on what's called location-based augmented reality. And we're building using a platform called Fresh Air. But you can go to their website, which is listed here at playfreshair.com. And they do have a commercially available um, platform that you can use to design and uh, play augmented reality experiences. So we're using this platform to um, place these blue dots near the pond represent hotspots. So in a Google Map-like interface on um, a web browser, me as the designer, I place um, these hotspots on a map. And then when the student goes out into the field using a mobile device like a smartphone, shown in the top corner, the students see this hotspot as a glowing sphere that's off in the distance. And there's a small label on that sphere telling them what the name of the hotspot is and how far away that hotspot is. So the students have to use their phone to navigate to that hotspot location. And when they arrive, information pops up at that location. So the reason that we're focusing on location-based augmented reality is that, number one, it can structure the student's path and, and actions through an environment. And the students, um, we can really point out to them interesting features of the natural environment that they might not have noticed if they had um, just gone out on the field trip without 
this support. So the kinds of things that students may see when they um, arrive at a hotspot would be images, um, text, video, audio. We can also insert questions. And this is particularly interesting because as students answer questions, we can um, branch the experience such that if students get a question right, they go towards a certain location versus if the students get a question wrong, they, we can send them to a different location. And this can help a teacher um, in the field to identify students who are having problems with some of the activities or concepts in the activity. Also, we played around with um, loading 3D models and animations into the activities to help illustrate some of the concepts that students are working with in the field. So these are the, the pieces that really pop up on the phone for the students when they arrive at these different hotspot locations. We're combining the hotspot and augmented reality technologies on the smartphone with um, probeware that allows the students to measure different variables in the environment. And in the pond, in the pond environment and the pond eco-mobile experience, we've been focusing on uh, letting students measure the same variables that they were able to measure in EcoMove. So the students can use this TI Inspire, Texas Instruments Inspire, that's connected with Vernier probes to measure things like dissolved oxygen, water temperature, air temperature, um, turbidity, and pH, for example. So the, um, and these, these, the probes and the types of measurements that they record and the, the specificity of the measurements is uh, akin to what a real scientist would be able to do out in the field. So what this looks like um, when students go out into the field is some, something like this. Uh, once again, we have our map with different hotspots shown with the red pins. And what I'm showing with the different colored arrows is potential pathways through these hotspots by different students. So the blue arrows might be student A who goes to one hotspot and sees um, an introductory material from our ranger Susan, who is um, your tour guide throughout the pond experience. And they may talk to ranger Susan and then go to another location and collect a sample. On the other hand, the student in orange may go to their first hotspot and see an animation that shows what dissolved oxygen looks like in water. And then they may go to the next location and also collect a sample. The students in this way can continue in the roles they had uh, in EcoMove, and they can um, then finally meet up at the end of the, the field trip experience and share the different experiences that each student had. To better illustrate some of the things that students do um, on these field trips, here's a table that shows the different roles that we've used in some of the experiences and the kinds of activities that students would do at these different hotspots based on these roles. So you can see that they're um, engaging in, in experiences like observing the ecosystem, measuring things, collecting things, and all of this is scaffolded by the combination of just-in-time information provided on the smartphone and the um, interaction with the probes and the, the measurement of, of data in the real world. We've also been working with other apps that can support the students in these activities, including Evernote, which many of you may be familiar with. But Evernote is really great for the students because they can use it for these observations. They collect um, pictures and notes and audio to document the different observations they're making. And one of the interesting things we've been doing lately is to really combine um, the observations of particular locations with the measurements so that the students can um, put together their, their macroscopic view of the world and sort of overlay that with their understanding of the, the measurements and the, the, the numbers that they're getting from the, uh, 
environmental probes. We implemented this, um, this experience with some students in, um, in the Cambridge area uh, last, actually two years ago now. And this was one of our first pilot activities. And so I wanted to share with you some of the findings that we took home from that pilot activity and that has been recently published in Computers and Education. So you can um, look up the reference for this paper to get all the full information. Um, but I'll just share with you some of the highlights of the uh, findings from this early pilot test. So we measured um, student attitudes about uh, data collection and their self-efficacy related to how confident they were about their ability to collect data and make sense of that data. And what we found was that um, their mean score on these affective measures did increase um, following uh, the EcoMobile field trip. Also from a content perspective, the students' um, scores improved. And most, most uh, notably, their scores improved on um, the measures that were related to the water quality and understanding what those water quality measurements meant. So that aligned well with um, the design of the activity. And one of the interesting take-home messages that we have is that this really changed the, the teacher's experience on field trips. And so here I've highlighted a couple of ways in which the teacher's experience um, differed from previous field trips. In the first quote, the teacher notes that it seemed that 90% of the time students were at the pond environment. They were working on interacting with the pond and their partners. And this is interesting because she compares it to previous times when it felt like maybe 60 or 50% of them were independently interacting. And this addresses one of the, the first misconceptions or well, conceptions that um, the teachers had when they started working with us is that many of them were concerned that um, the, the technology would uh, distract students from being able to notice and pay attention to the real world. But we actually did not find that to be true. We found that the students um, having a sort of personalized guide in their hand with the mobile technology um, made a lot of them uh, pay more attention to the things that they were observing at that time and place. The other aspect the teacher brought out was um, that she saw the students getting to see parts of the world that they don't normally see, like microscopic creatures and what the pH level is. And she noted that you know, in a lot of cases, students don't even think about those things being there or um, the impact that they might have on, on the ecosystem. So we used the, the augmented reality to present the students with things like um, animations with the molecular uh, view of um, dissolved oxygen and water in the pond so that students could get a sense of what those molecules might look like when, so they understand what it means when they get a reading of 6.8 for a dissolved oxygen reading on their probe. And we also um, allowed students to see uh, views of things like um, uh, microscopic organisms and kind of replicated what they had been able to do with the virtual submarine in EcoMove. So we're using the complementary um, elements that students got to use in EcoMove and carrying them over into the real world so that students can use some of the same strategies and ideas to explore the real environment that they were using to explore the virtual environment. Finally, one of the things the teacher talked about was the change that EcoMove brought to her own practice in, on field trips. She said that she wasn't directing things, that it felt really different to her, and she liked it. It felt more like what she liked to think of teaching as being. So she talked about how um, uh, it really allowed her to be a facilitator of the experience rather than feeling like she had to be a, a talking head in front of the entire class trying to get all of the students' attention. The students were able to instead work on the activities at their own pace, and she was then able to circulate around and help students that needed it. 
So as we move forward, what we've learned from, from that initial pilot activity was that we do see um, how augmented reality with probes, particularly in combination, can support each other and support students um, in implementing some of these uh, inquiry practices in real world ecosystems. But the interesting part that we didn't anticipate was this effect on, on the pedagogy that students, that teachers were able to use when they were, were working with students in outdoor learning environments. As we move forward with the eco-mobile work, we're um, further exploring how these immersive technologies can be leveraged in service of some of those um, goals that align with the next generation science standards. In particular, we're looking at how um, these activities of, of collecting your own data and uh, being able to, to quickly and easily collaborate around those data and bring those data back to the classroom in both, um, in both the Evernote uh, form of being able to see a, a picture of, of the location you collect your, your data, but also the numeric values. And being able to have students use multiple representations of the data and of the location, we think will help students to be able to use those data as a form of evidence and then um, use it to uh, engage in scientific argumentation when they get back to the classroom. We're also continuing this work to explore how um, these immersive technologies can really be leveraged to uh, to focus student attention on cross-cutting concepts like patterns and cause and effect and stability and change. And this work um, grows out of work that Tina Grotzer, one of the uh, PIs on this project, is doing, where she has really spent a lot of um, time thinking deeply about how uh, young people understand complex systems and understand the complex interactions and causal interactions in those systems. So across both EcoMove and EcoMobile, we're using different approaches and techniques of, that the technology allows to try and um, help students to understand these cause and effect relationships. And through doing this, what um, one of our big uh, hypotheses are that we are trying to explore is that by um, here you see the, the multi-user virtual environment on the right and you see the real pond on the left that the multi-user virtual environment happens to be modeled on and with our work we're, we're building students understanding in the virtual environment then allowing them to go to these real environments and we hope that mapping between these two experiences will help students to be able to see how the concepts and practices that they're using in both places transfer to real world situations and um, hopefully transfer to uh, situations outside of just the ecosystem science realm. So with that, we've, we've left um, time, 20 minutes for questions. Um, here's a slide that shows you where you can go to get the free download of the EcoMove curriculum which, as I said, was, is freely available to, to teachers so that they can use it in their classroom um, as soon as they like. Whereas EcoMobile is an ongoing research project, um, so the, we have these preliminary findings we've shared with you, but um, we're still working on uh, pursuing other research questions. And if you happen to be in the area nearby us, um, we may be able to work with you as a partner group in our research. But um, here's our contact information if you want to follow up with us on these ideas. But now I think that we can um, open up the floor for questions. And I'll try to uh, put the permissions such that people can um, use the audio and we'll open it up for questions. OK, I believe everyone has audio permissions now. so. Um, Please. This is Jim Vanice. Um, this is fantastic. I really enjoy hearing what you're describing. And, and um, I've heard Chris Deedy talk about it before at uh, ISTE conferences and things. Um, and so, suddenly, it's finally dawning, dawning on me just how interesting it is when you overlay an uh, 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 augmented world on top of the real world in, in doing field science. That's very cool. But so, is this something, though, that 
is so easy that students could create for other students or that teachers could create for their own students based on their own curriculum? Or is this like something that needs like a development team to create these experiences? That's a great question. Thank you. Um, the, I would say that the platform itself is easy enough to use that teachers can certainly use it. Um, and I think that maybe, you know, appropriately scaffolded students could also use it, um, particularly somewhat older students would be able to use it. Um, but one comment I would make is just that um, as technology, as these kinds of technologies become more pervasive, um, I think it, it will be quite easy for folks to, to, to try their hand at augmented reality and um, create, you know, mini field trips or uh, tours through natural environments. And I think that one of the things we're really trying to explore with this uh, research is how to best design those experiences, because I think that's really the key point, is that anyone can probably put these together, but what designs and what, um, what elements inserted into these kinds of experiences really help students with the learning goals? So I think that's the critical question to ask as you start to design these things. But yes, I think that anyone can, and I'm sure that thoughtful folks out there would come up with some really fantastic designs that support learning. Amy, there are some questions in the chat, too. Oh, great. Can, if you see them, why don't you read them aloud? and? Sure. What do you wish? What do you know now that you wish you had known before you started? <laughs> that was a great question. <laughs> oh, where to start? I think one one aspect that comes out to me is. Um, really putting ourselves in the shoes of the students in terms of how they use and understand these technologies. Um, with the hotspots, as you design the experiences, there are a number of ways you can use the hotspots. The hotspots can be um, uh, one after the other in a linear fashion, or they can almost act more like a choose-your-own-adventure. You, know, you can present many hotspots to students and have them choose which ones they might go to. And we've played around with these different designs to see should we design this as a linear um, sort of narrative kind of experience for the students or should we design this as one where they have free choice about which uh, hotspots they're going to. And both, both designs have, have merits, but one thing we've, we've realized is that the students um, you know, as they interact with a the hotspot, they don't know what that hotspot means until you help them understand it. And we, um, if you're going to do a linear sort of breakdown of, of an experience, then the students need to know what they're going to expect with each progressive hotspot. You can't just, you know, have a linear portion of the experience and then move to one where they have free choice. There needs to be sort of consistency in the way um, you apply the design so that the students know what to expect and can really use their expectations to make good decisions and um, feel like the experience is, is going well for them. Um. That makes sense to me. Um, also, I guess a lot of ongoing technical things that we've had to work out for ourselves um, in regards to using um, phone technology out in the field and learning about connectivity and the impact of weather issues or the fact that you have 30 or 40 kids trying to access the same link at the same time. Um, and a lot of pieces like that that we're still trying to figure out. 
Yeah, and I think that's probably one of the challenges um, to the earlier question we had about people being able to design their own experiences and, and play them. I think that um, these technologies are, you know, really at the forefront of what we can do. Um, and there are still many areas of the country and of the world where the um, mobile broadband uh, availability is not currently at, at um, you know, a level that, that a lot of people could, could do these things in their own backyards. So we're kind of um, trying to, to explore the affordances of these technologies before um, maybe we're ready to actually implement them at scale. So hopefully we'll have some good insights into how to design these things by the time the technology catches up um, across the country and across the world. Right. Um, we have another question about um, from Ryan Wicks, if you're still on. Um, he wrote, I noticed that this program is primarily an exploratory experience. Have you considered any competitive experiences? Do you see any advantages to a competitive scenario? I would imagine that such a competitive scenario might offer good opportunities for problem solving, creativity, and innovation. Um, Ryan, I'm not quite sure what you mean by competitive. I could take a stab at that, even not knowing quite what the competitive might mean. Um, uh -huh. So far, the, the, the platform we're using is quite flexible. You can set up experiences to be sort of along a spectrum of, of game, gaminess, I might say. Um, but yeah, you can make them very sort of game-like and perhaps competitive if, you know, depending on the kind of game you're trying to design. But our experiences have been, um, there, sometimes we do integrate sort of game-like elements with, with um, uh, the way the students collaborate and the way the students do have to meet goals, but um, we haven't focused on this work as particularly a game, um, but there would definitely be potential to use the same platform to really design things in a, in a more game-like way and mm. potentially um, one thing we do see is, is the students already do have a sense, in some cases, students do bring a sense of competitiveness to it, like the, they might race from one hotspot to another just because they sort of view it almost like a game. And so um, they, sometimes they bring that to it themselves without us necessarily uh, making that a huge feature of the design. So one of the things I would add, um, and we're finding really, the, the students really give us feedback about, is the way that this connects with something that's right in their backyard. Um, we've had students uh, in interviews talk about how, you know, they, they never would have noticed this, or they never would have um, thought about how what they were doing in class actually fits in with a stream right behind their house, but now they're starting to make those connections. And so I think that's one of the big pluses of just helping students to, to get outside and to um, carry with them those things that they were doing in the classroom so that they can start to apply them in these spaces that are familiar to them. Great. Um, any other questions? Jim wrote, can students leave behind a message, comment, or question behind at the hotspot, like a geocache? That's a cool idea, but you know, the software doesn't support that. One of the things that we, um, we do with students, though, is that they use um, Evernote. Lately, we've been using Evernote with students in the field as a way for them to collect evidence. So then back in the classroom, they can see and uh, see each other's Evernote, you know, photos of parts of the ecosystem and the notes that they've taken and share those with um, their classmates. And so that's been a really nice way for them to um, share what they were doing and what they found with each other. And those, to build on that, 
um, those Evernote files do uh, get populated in real time such that the students, as they're taking pictures and saving them to Evernote, they can see each other's pictures and notes. And they can, um, when we get back to the classroom, they are able to see those notes on a map. So they can see little pins for all the different notes that their, um, that their classmates collected. And so we're, we've been using that in combination with the data to help them understand the spatial um, variability in data and the spatial variability in, you know, different um, other variables, um, you know, in the amount of trees, the amount of sun, and all these things that they sort of are able to observe, but maybe not necessarily collect um, data using probes. And Jim also wants to know how he can stay in touch with our progress and whether we have a blog or a Facebook page. Great question. I think the best way is probably to get on, um, to go to our website and, well, you can get on the EcoMove uh, mailing list. We currently don't have one for EcoMobile, but we, we could and we should. Yeah, we're working on improving our um, website actually this semester, so I will um, add that to our um, set of goals to to try to update our our website and populate it more with news and updates. So thanks for your interest. <laughs> We're usually a presence at uh, conferences like AERA and NARST, so uh, maybe we'll see you in Philadelphia or Pittsburgh this spring. I see one other question that came in from Mark. Um, he asked, do they their evidence to each other. And yes, they do. Um, we typically have been doing this part back in the classroom. The students, we've, we've, we've tested sort of various ways they can do this, um, but one of them has just been to use Google, Google spreadsheets, which a lot of students are using in their classrooms these days. And so they've been able to uh, update, upload their, their data to Google spreadsheets and then they can um, share among themselves with the data. But we've also had, um, so that's the data, but all in terms of the observational evidence, they've also been um, bringing, we've been bringing Evernote back up in the classroom and the students have been doing activities where, um, you know, we ask someone to give us a good picture of, um, of a location where they thought there would be a high temperature reading. And so, you know, students raise their hands and someone brings up a picture um, from their Evernote account showing uh, a really sunny um, spot near the, the shore. And then we, you know, look at the data that came from that location and compare it to data that um, came from the shady spot on the other side of the dock. And so the students are definitely bringing the data that they collected to the classroom and um, using it in the discussions that follow. Okay, are there any other questions? And now we're just, now there's chat about what conferences we go to. We are often at ISTE as well. So, we may be there too. Or, you know. And I know that Chris will be presenting at, um, Jim brought up Cozen, and right. Chris will be presenting at Cozen this coming spring. So you can look for him there as well. And this fall in Chicago at uh, Wireless Ed Tech. I believe. Well, thank you, everybody. I think that um, probably wraps up our talk for today. It's been a great experience.
Yeah, thank you everyone for um, the great conversation and your kind comments uh, in the chat throughout the, um, the talk. Really enjoyed this. Thanks a lot.